Hello, a very warm welcome to Creative Bureaucracy Festival Meets Science. I'm Julia Stamm and I direct the Creative Bureaucracy Festival. I'm delighted to welcome you to another exciting conversation in our series CBF Meets Science that we convene in the context of the Berlin Science Week. In our interview series, we focus on the relationship between science and policymaking, and we look in particular at the question of how scientific findings and recommendations can make their way into our administrations. And in today's edition, we look in particular at the nexus of research and evidence for policy and decision-making processes. I'm very, very happy that Runa Mijumbi has agreed to join us for today's conversation. Welcome, Runa. Thank Runa you, is, Runa is a research scientist and health policy analyst. She trained as a medical doctor and is currently a senior public lecturer of public policy at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine in the UK. She is also the founding director of the Center for Rapid Evidence Synthesis, ACRIS, in Uganda. And we will be talking about that, Runa, quite a bit, I think. Runa has been working at the nexus of research and other evidence and the policy and decision-making processes for over a decade. She has been involved in championing the evidence to policy field in Africa and has been behind the pilot or scale-up of several knowledge translation units and platforms in the region and beyond. Her interests include, among others, interrogating the evidence to policy nexus, especially in complex contexts such as health security and health diplomacy. So again, a very warm welcome, Runa. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Julia. It's a pleasure. We will start our conversation with a question I'm asking all my interviewees. Um, we're here in the context of the Creative Bureaucracy Festival. So I'm wondering, when you hear the words creative bureaucracy, what comes to mind spontaneously? OK, Julia, I, I actually found it very interesting the first time I saw the word or the words. But quickly, what comes to mind? And I tried to put them together, and I just thought, oxymoron. <laughs> so the first thing that comes, bureaucracy is really government, red tape, difficulty navigating something, you know, and yet creative. I think about, you know, that open, imaginative, I can do anything yeah, kind of thing, innovation, imaginative, novel. So much as they look like they're two different um, worlds basically but when i bring them together i imagine innovative ways of dealing with governments or navigating government systems or working with them you know what are those different approaches aside from looking at it as difficulty you actually begin to work out how do i actually do this you know in a novel and innovative way that's what comes to mind julia Fantastic. So innovative ways also of dealing with, with government systems. And uh, I'm sure, you know, you are someone who has quite a bit of understanding, you know, when it comes to thinking about new ways exactly. to engage with policy making. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, as I said earlier, you're really one of the champions of the evidence to policy field in Africa, and you've really been involved in, you know, setting up a lot of translation units and platforms in your region, but also beyond this. So can you tell us a little more about your work, what you do and practice, and also how you became so involved in this field? Thanks, Julia. You know, my getting into this work, you know, work around evidence to policy was not a deliberate move. It was what you would say, somebody was seeking a job, but they found a passion. So I trained as a medical doctor, as you mentioned, you know, earlier. And after practicing for a while as a GP and also in neurosurgery, I did a master's in epidemiology and biostatistics, which was my introduction to the world of research. And then later I did a master's in international public health, majoring in health policy. Now bringing this, uh, this set of skills and knowledge together put me in the right place when a project whose aim was to develop and evaluate knowledge translation approaches to support the use of research evidence for policy in African health systems took off. This project, um, which ref we referred to at, at the time as SURE project, involved seven African countries, Uganda being one of them, and that's where I was, and four Northern partners, including the World Health Organization. Now on this project, I was handed the portfolio of developing a rapid response service the first known in a low income country. And this was in fact against evidence, which at the time said such a mechanism could not work in a low income country. So we had no blueprint, but also we were working against the tide. It, you know, uh, it was 
like something as you build it, flying a plane as you build it, you know, that kind of situation. And I learned so much along the way. And I think it was this space of innovation, this space where we didn't know and we had to try out this and the other that really got my, uh, you know, interest in there. It is so easy to say what works now, but back then, and this is not even very far back, this is 2010, back then it actually wasn't as clear. So that was my first introduction to the world where science meets society. Before that, I was your hardcore scientist. Even when I went into research, it was your quantitative numbers person, you know? The person I am today would hardly recognize that person, you know, aside from both of them being diligent at what they do, that would be it. That is how much things have actually changed with me understanding this science to policy, science to society, science to administration, science to practice, science to, you know, what we call the other side, the non-science side. This is how much, um, you know, it has changed me as a person and my understanding of the world generally. Um, so, so that was my first link to science and policy. And I've been at this next task for about 12, 13 years now. I work with stakeholders, mostly governments and bilateral partners, their decision-making processes on one side and then research processes on another side, looking for ways to link for mutual benefit. That is fascinating, you know, also, you know, you talking about being a really a very different person compared to what yes. you were before. So when you're looking, you know, at this person, at the person you have become, and yes. you look at, at, you know, the way you are actually interacting at the science policy interface, how would you describe your role? Um, so I would describe myself as a knowledge or evidence broker. Some people refer to this now as an intermediary. And this is in the assumption <laughs> that we have two distinct worlds of evidence or knowledge on one side and decision-making or practice or administration on another. That, you know, that distinction might not be as black and white at any one point, but for the purposes of our conversation today, let's assume that you know, these two worlds actually exist that way. So I work and also research the point at which these two worlds meet. And my role is to ensure that there are relationships that ensure that you know, the available knowledge benefits the appropriate decision-making process. And, you know, at any one point, what we see as the decision-makers could actually be the ones generating knowledge that researchers benefit from, and also the other way around, which is, you know, what we are used to, that the researchers generate the science and, and, and the decision-makers uh, actually take it up. But that's why I was saying that it's not exactly a black and white. At any one point, these two could actually change roles. So this can be, so, so what I do in, in trying to link this can be in ensuring access to different kinds of evidence where access is both, you know, the physical, but especially the technical access. It can also be in developing interactive platforms for the two worlds to meet. It can also be in developing capacity for each world to be able to engage the other meaningfully. It can be in doing research on what works and what doesn't for different contexts that I'm involved with. I have specifically you know, focused on doing this for complex situations. So situations that require urgent decision or policy making. So such situations may be mirrored in what we saw during the pandemic. I think so many people can relate um, with how decision making was happening at the time or what is currently happening in my country in Uganda with the Ebola epidemic you know, where decision makers need to respond to a situation within a matter of hours or days or at most a few weeks, and they need evidence to be able to do this appropriately. So that's my current role and the role that I've played over the last decade. Thank you very much, Runa. So you spoke about, you know, what you need to do to make sure that the available knowledge benefits the decision-making process. So when you think, you know, in broader terms about the relationship between science and policy making, also the transfer of scientific results into policy, what are, you know, in your experience, what are the most important challenges? I have a laundry list. That. <laughs> Let me highlight maybe two or three, you know, that, that um, I really find are a major you know, challenge uh, at the nexus. So one, understanding the translation process is one of the biggest challenges. So when I talk about translation, I'm talking about taking um, 
let me use the word evidence loosely here, taking evidence to policy or taking it to um, um, practice or really think it's going to be used. So for many, this process either doesn't exist or it is as simple as I have a product, take it, or I want a product, give it to me, or where can I find it, you know? We still have world renowned researchers believing that because they have very good, you know, findings from science, from research, from a survey, they should just be taken up into the decision making process. And if they're not, then the leaders must be either corrupt or they're not very smart or something of the sort. They do not realize that what they actually have in terms of findings is data, it's information, it's research findings that might not even make sense to their own peers, leave alone a policymaker. They do not realize that there is a process that you have to go through to change these data information findings into evidence first, and then change this into knowledge that can actually be actioned by the policymaker. And when those processes do not happen, either the information is not used or it's not used appropriately. So we still have a huge challenge about that translation process. Another challenge is science still being viewed as elitist and belonging to the ivory tower and those that sit in the ivory towers. That identity makes science inaccessible for many. The average policymaker, if they have this feeling about science, they always steer far from it, you know? Science still intimidates many policy and decision makers because of the identity it is given or the identity it carries. This identity may be prestigious for many scientists, but it actually makes their products very difficult to engage with, you know? And the third challenge that I will highlight is that the pathways for science to get into decision-making processes are often not clear. You know, and, and, and this is especially also for low income countries where I have really practiced. So a scientist with great evidence, even when they have taken the steps to translate it to actionable messaging, will have trouble locating the right way to get it to the right table for it to make a difference. Some of these pathways are deliberately closed because that's the nature of, of uh, decision making, especially at high levels. But also where they are not deliberately closed, in many systems, there's no information about how I get science to the table to make decisions. And so that's still a very big challenge as well, not only for researchers, but even those within the decision-making process, those pathways are not clear for them as well. Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much, Runa. Um, so you have been very clear in you know, where you think those, those translation challenges lie, but also institutional challenges and also challenges in, in understanding, you know, basically what the other side needs mm -hmm. right? and, and can take on. So um, probably I would like to link my next two questions. Um, so what would need to happen to make this transfer easier? You know, how does science have to change, but maybe also how administration have to change? Um, and then in the next step, I would like to talk about the center that you have been building, but maybe we start with a more general question first, and then we go uh, to your center. So Julia, what I believe we need to do is to create more interactive platforms, you know, more opportunities for the two sides to interact, more opportunities for each side to understand the needs and experiences of the other. When a researcher knows what happens with the policy and government side, and when governments understand the motivations of researchers and the processes they have to go through, you know, to discover the science that they do, the mutual empathy, the demystifying of things, the knowledge and understanding of each other's world will make a whole lot of difference. So each side will know what they need to interact with the other in terms of knowledge, in terms of skills, and in terms of attitudes. For example, when a researcher knows that for a policymaker, when they're making a decision, it's not just about the sense alone. There is the budget, you know, that they have to think about. There is the politics, what's in the manifesto. Their party promised something to the people and they have to, you know, this means a lot to them. For us scientists, it looks like, well, it's, it's trivial politics. He's just thinking about his position. It is the reality of decision-making in the government. And once a researcher knows that, they're able to consider it not only in execution of their work or when they are selling this final product they have, 
they're able to also incorporate it in the decision making process when they are prioritizing you know the research that they're trying to do and trying to align themselves with government especially if they actually want to support government in decision making and vice versa for the policymaker when they know how research is actually done they are able to interact with the researcher and see how their priority questions can actually be prioritized on the research agenda how they can actually help the researcher you know understand what their needs are so the more these two sides interact the more we will be able to deal with many of these challenges julia thank you very much Runa. this is very i would say very practical also the recommendations that you've been giving um, so now let's talk about your own work, you know, and how you put this in practice. Um, so you are the founding director, as I said earlier, of the Center for Rapid Evidence Synthesis. You know, I love the title at Makerere University. So maybe you can give us a little bit of background. What were the reasons for founding the center? Maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, who was involved in setting it up? What did it take to set it up? And also what would you say is particular about the center? So, Julia, the center builds on work that I talked about earlier, you know, work that began in 2010 as part of the SURE project. It evolved or has evolved through different project setups into a university academic center at Macquarie University in Uganda, and then into an autonomous organization today. It's a center of excellence whose goal was and still is to support urgent policy and decision making with high quality, relevant and timely evidence. I think what is particular about the center is its focus on timeliness, timely evidence. The evidence reaches the policymaker at the time they actually need it for the particular decision making process. So how this goal is delivered has evolved over the years from just synthesizing evidence for questions posed by policymakers to being a part of global agenda setting in the evidence reform decision making field and you know so much in between. Now building this center has taken time and intellect and of course so many of the resources we know would be involved. It has taken being foresighted and understanding the trends of where the world is heading in terms of the political economy and social politics. I have been its face for a very long time, but there are many people who have been instrumental in its setup. And when you listen to the different categories of the people you know, that I'm going to mention, it then also tells you what it took, not in terms of the personal people, but in terms of you know, the capacity that came together to actually put it you know, um, together. So for example, Professor Nelson Sawan Campbell, a world renowned scientist, one of the people who first discovered and characterized the HIV virus and the disease has been there from the idea stage, you know, um, of this to its current status, working in the background and mentoring the team. Dr. Andrew Oxman, who's the current research director of the Center for Epidemic Interventions Research at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health in Oslo, was the uh, principal investigator of the SURE project, you know, at the time we started this work. And there is no way the center would be what it is today, you know, without that initial input, uh, or intellectual input that, you know, Dr. Oxman had. The researchers and engine of this center, you know, including Dr. Ismail Kawoya, Dr. Edward Kayongo, Dr. Pastan Lusiba, and all of these, you know, they might have the name doctor, but not all of them like a medical doctors, but they're really um, intellectuals in their fields. And many, you know, that sit and work through the night. So that engine that actually gets the work done while I do the interviews and look good, you know? So there are all these people who sit and work through the night just to make sure that if evidence is needed in 48 hours, it will be there in 48 hours. If it's needed in three days, it will be there in three days. So there's a whole engine of researchers working and synthesizing information behind the scenes. There have been policymakers, you know, who understood this concept right away and made it possible for the center to pilot and learn as it was being built. If you remember, we didn't have a blueprint and we were trying out and learning as we went. So there was the, lock, the late uh, Dr. Isaac Ezati, who was the Director General of Health Services, you know, at the time we started this work, he was exceptional. He gave us the space, you know, to try and fail 
try and make it, but he really did understand what it actually meant for evidence to try and get in in a timely manner for decision. There were others, you know, outside Uganda, but they used the service for their own governments, you know, giving us a chance again to understand how things work. So there's Dr. Damsion Kathiola in Malawi. He's now a commissioner. At the time, he was the director of his uh, research department in Malawi. Um, there was Madame Key in Burkina Faso, who actually allowed us to develop the Burkina Faso Rapid Response Service, you know, uh, which was supposed to be sitting in the Ministry of Health in, in Ouagadougou. He allowed, she allowed the service to actually develop and operate out of Uganda for the first six months, which gave us additional you know, um, capacity and understanding. And there are many others. There have been outstanding funders. You know, there's no way you could do this without them. There were outstanding funders who are willing to take the risk on this unknown phenomena and, and try it out with us. So the European Union, the International Development Research Center in Canada and the Hewlett Foundation have really been invaluable. Uh, the center would, would have not been able to evolve, you know, as it has, uh, as it has, again, without exceptional partnerships. So again, you cannot do this on your own. So we've had partnerships with which we've explored concepts. So we have these learning journeys and, and, and learning sessions with the Africa Center for Evidence in Johannesburg. Um, we, we, we have uh, exceptional partners with the Center for, sorry, partnerships with the Center for Best Practices in Cameroon and the University of Zambia. Again, with these ones, you sort of test out what you're thinking and you go in together, putting your foot together. It's been exceptional. And then I also mentioned with Pride, McMaster University in Canada, again, these are partnerships that have helped us to build capacity within the team. So, so all of these sort of embody and, and bring out what it actually takes to be able to build what we see as a center of excellence today. But without even a single one of them and many others I probably haven't mentioned, there's no chance that we would see what we see today. Yeah, that is outstanding, Runa. And uh, I think it's really important that you that you uh, draw the attention or draw the attention on, you know, the importance of, of partners, of partnerships, and of funders. And what I can see, this is really some sort of an international alliance also that was backing the efforts there. Which brings me to a question that, I don't know, you might find easy or not easy to answer, namely, you know, the work that you're doing there, also with the center, you know, in how far is this something that is very difficult, also where you set it up or very typical for an African context? Or is it something that can be generalized or are there parts yet maybe other parts of the world could learn from? You see where, where I'm getting at? Yes, yes. So, so Julia, um, I think it goes either way. Um, we were lucky that we were not boxed into uh, a certain sort of framework that this is how things work. And so we went in and tried. And for that to happen, you know, um, you have to have a very supportive environment. And so I wouldn't say for the African context that everywhere we try to do that, it actually happened. There are places we actually went in and, and you know, things didn't work out. So a supportive environment, whether you are you know, in Africa or wherever is very, very important. Because remember this again, you could set up a very nice structure, but it's not complete when the demand side does not work, especially because it's demand driven, you know? So if the government and the government institutions are not willing to give you that environment to try things out, then it's not easy. And so where we found that open, it was easy. Where we didn't find it, it wasn't easy. But also I think they are uh, stereotypes that you have to go against. They are stereotypes that, that, that you have to fight against even within a willing environment like that. So people are so used. When we first started this work, everybody said, everybody felt that incorporating evidence, having to consider evidence, having to read a policy brief was just extra work. When I've always made these decisions. For the last 20 years, I've been a policymaker. I've never had to do this. And I still make decisions and my country has never fallen off the map. You know? So, so going against attitudes like those was actually extremely difficult in the beginning. 
Um, and then, of course, like I said, the way science is viewed, many policymakers uh, feel like, you know, this is a no-go area for me. They'll actually try to avoid it. And when we started off, we really considered research evidence only. And all these other forms of evidence have only come later. And so the average policymaker interacting with science, trying to understand it was quite difficult. And many of them, you know, were just not willing, especially if they can get away with it. And that's the other thing, accountability systems. If there are no systems that actually hold the policymaker to account, like, did you use evidence? How did you arrive at this? They'll just, you know, avoid you and, and, and um, do what they know how to do. So Julia, in, in, in some places it was easy. The environment was willing, there's political will, but then within that environment, there are different, you know, um, sports and factors that may make this very uh, challenging. But what I can say for sure, that if you press on and press on and press on and actually prove the benefit of this work, even those who were running away will give you a call one day and say, are you the lady who was telling me that you can actually help me with, yeah, 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 yeah. Do you have a few minutes? You know, the, the, it actually stays somewhere and they'll bump into your work and they'll realize how important it is and they'll come back to you. So it's a matter of pressing on and being, um, you know, just press on and stay in there and it eventually works out. It says, don't give up hope, but always yes. come back, you know, and say, this is what we can do for you. Exactly. Um, Runa, we are nearing the end of the conversation, unfortunately, already. Um, it was super interesting and I would have loved, you know, to um, to turn this into a much longer exchange, but maybe we can do this as another um, opportunity. There is a final question that I would like to ask you, and it really links to what you've just been describing, namely, you know, um, the importance of political will, but also of the context then, you know, that you find in, in certain environments or not. So my concluding question would be the following one. So because we here, you know, think about creative bureaucracy. Um, so how can creative bureaucracy, you know, play a positive role in, in overcoming potential tensions between science and, you know, the policymaking sphere? Yes, Julia, I, I, I'm so glad that, that, you know, we conclude with that. What is it that we can actually do? And it goes back, I think, to wrap, you know, a few of the messages uh, or the bigger messages that uh, I, I sort of brought forward earlier that we just really need to demystify the two worlds and create a platform for the two to interact more and more. Many of the tensions that we see between science and politics or science and the administration, many of these tensions come from both sides not knowing each other's worlds very well, you know? And then you have them being suspicious and making assumptions of each other's world. But if we took care of this, so much would change for both science and politics or administration. There would be so much assumption gotten out of the way. This, instead of suspicion, we would actually build these friendships where they both tap into each other's you know, uh, worlds to make things work for their own objectives. So I believe what we need to do um, in terms of creative bureaucracy is to provide that platform and the opportunities for interaction for both worlds. Thanks very much, Runa. I, you know, I love that we're finishing off on this idea of friendships, you know, and how we can actually build those relationships and how we can, you know, contribute to demystifying the two worlds. So these are ideas that I'm going to take with me also, you know, for, for the festival as we think about, you know, what this could look like. And uh, I thank you very much for your thoughts, for your reflections, for sharing your experiences. I think it was wonderful. And yes, I hope to, um, to see you again uh, and to continue our conversation on this. Thanks very much, Rona. Thank you, Julia. Thank you for giving me the chance to share my experiences. You take care.